Welcome to our recording of the Unix Security Workshop. The sessions were chaired by Neil Todd from GID Limited, who is also a member of the UKUG Advisory Committee. Our first speaker is Russell Brand from the Lawrence Livermore Labs, who is going to talk about the Hackman Project, investigating security issues in Unix. I'm Russell Brand, over from the United States, and I'm here to tell you about one of the two or three things that keeps me busy and away from my real work. Many of you have probably heard rumors that suggest that Unix, at least as distributed by most vendors, has a number of security vulnerabilities. Now, those of us that are comfortable with the C compiler can, of course, go and build our own new vulnerabilities. And it's, well, that's fine. The problem is that a lot of naive system administrators just mount the tape as they get it and they have system vulnerabilities that they haven't created themselves. And that doesn't seem to be quite fair or cricket. Now, the primary author of this work in progress is Peter Shipley, so all the hard questions can go to him. And I'm just here because I have a travel budget and a passport, and he has neither. Now, before we talk about the content, we have to include a couple of the standard disclaimers. First, and most importantly, the United States Department of Energy, Lawrence Livermore National Labs, etc., take no accountability for what I say and have not yet decided whether they are going to accept this project or not. In terms of timing, they're supposed to figure that out by Friday, and they could not push it up a couple of days. The University of California at Berkeley also takes no responsibility for the project, but has agreed to give us historic data computer problems of the past that have supposedly been fixed several times. The book is not yet available unless you are a contributor in one form or another. And of course, anything that I say is my opinion and not necessarily that of the primary author. Now, we put a couple of cautions up when we set up a new Unix system for people that are used to something a, a little more user-oriented and less hacker-friendly, if you will, things sort of like this. With the default distribution tape, we're thinking of putting on another sticker which says, do not run after installing unless someone of great competence goes through it and fixes everything back the way it should be. Part of the goal of Hackman would be to help the vendors give us a system that people could just install and run and not feel terribly unsafe about. Hackman started out to be an encyclopedic catalog of security bugs, past, present, and perhaps even future. This got to be very large, very fast, and we decided to limit ourselves to Unix security bugs as people were more willing to talk about them and it was more than one vendor and weren't picking on people. And there were, well, too many of those to fit into one small volume and too much to test. So we're thinking of limiting it further to just BSD and BSD derivative bugs. We're open to suggestion about this, especially now that people are making merged kernels with the POSIX standards and merged systems. So the System 5 bugs will probably be able to be used in your BSD systems in the near future. Of course, a book that was just a list gets to be a little dull, and it's hard to convince the publishers that people would actually want such a thing. So there's the compulsory other stuff or other fluff, if you prefer, at the beginning and end to turn it into a book. So the question becomes first, what is a bug? And as far as we're concerned, a bug is something that lets someone do something that you wouldn't have wanted them to do if you would have known they could have done it. Things like default file protections being wrong on a system count as bugs and we'll have a list of those, but it's not in the list of main bugs, things that you can just fix with Chmod. Now before we go into the structure of what we're giving about each bug, I'll show you the two-week out-of-date table of content with a few letters truncated. We've been averaging one new 
YYP, the, the Yellow Page server, security bug a day for the past several weeks. <laughs> we're thinking that if we were to make a short book, we could just write it on YP, send mail, and finger. And perhaps that would keep us busy for a while. Now, the table of contents, whenever I print it for a talk, is a surprise for me, because my printed version is about 10 copies out of date. Anything printed is too old with a computer. And so I find that, A, bugs I thought we had written up have gone away from the table of contents, because there are new variants of them that we found we <coughs> don't have fully down. And the structure of the book changes a great deal. People who went to the first progress report we'll see that this table of contents looks nothing like theirs. So for each bug, we have a very short name. You've just seen the list of names of bugs that we have, quote, complete, end quote, descriptions of. Leave that up there for a bit. The introduction, which is the one sentence version. And if you read the introduction, you'll know whether this is the bug you're thinking of or not. The names just aren't long enough to give you that. The names are just references so that someone can say, oh, yes, I fixed bug 28, which is yet another YP bug. <laughs> a description, which is sort of a paragraph version of how it works. And if you read the description, you know a lot about Unix, you'll be able to do it. If you read the description and you don't know a lot about Unix, it isn't quite enough to replicate it by. The domain, or where it works, what versions of Unix have it? Where have it been fixed? The idea here is that old Unixes never die. In the past two months, I've come across more systems running 4.1a than you would ever believe. Calling up the system managers, they tell me that they had, quote, contractors writing some special programs and they haven't been able to get them to port properly. Now, for every bug, there's a reason. Programs, in a sense, have a belief about their environment, or at least programmers have beliefs about their environment, for those of you that don't believe in artificial intelligence. And you have a bug because, of course, some belief or another is violated. Some programs believe that only privileged programs will talk to them. Some programs believe that they'll be called with only alphanumeric characters and die when there's a meta character. Some programs believe in short strings, and you send them 1,025 characters, and you'd be amazed what they'd be willing to do. The most controversial section is the demonstration section. This is a very short line or two, maybe a tiny C program, which says, you can do this in your own living room. This is how. Often with footnotes saying you should do full tape backups before trying this. <laughs> People that have ignored that warning have regretted it. And then there are fixes. Some of the fixes are as easy as, OK, get these things to run, set group ID. Some are a line to add to a make file. Some of them are source changes. We have a question as to whether large source changes, whether we should include the diffs at all or just tell people where they can FTP them from since no one wants to type in more than a page of, of code changes anyway, not even a vendor. The history section is somewhat amusing. Where was this bug first discovered? Where was it fixed? Where was it reintroduced? Where was it refixed? Where was it re-reintroduced? What sort of terrible things have happened as a result? It's very sad to notice that some of the bugs that were found in 4.1a still exist in the most recent release of Sun OS 4.0.2 and may very well make it onto the BSD 4.4 tape. We're working on that. Then there are some additional notes, things that say, well, this same type of attack works for five, 500 other programs, here's how, or this is one of the bugs exploited by a famous internet worm, or Something like that. Now, people who are at the last progress re report in Portland, we spoke there about participation. And people who are at the, the ASOP 
conference, we also spoke about participation there. We were originally just trying to distribute preprints by a company called Tite. Tite, unfortunately, is no more. They went bankrupt for reasons not associated with us. There are people who are nervous with dealing with a private company having this information anyway. So we've asked Lawrence Livermore National Labs to make a UCID, a document that would be given out to vendors of Unix, to government laboratories, to other people that have a need to have the information early. And then after a certain amount of lead time, we'd make it available to the general public. If they say no, the US Air Force may make it an attempt at distributing it for us. They have some terrible tendency to classify everything, so we're a little bit nervous about dealing with them. The only people who have copies so far are people who've given us bugs that we haven't had yet, or given us information about bugs that we haven't known yet. And I think that numbers four people out of our group plus another six people who've done regression testing. Now, there are some open questions that I'd like some help with. I figure if I have a room full of people who have used Unix much longer than I have, I should ask. The first is, should we really include the System 5 stuff at all? Or can we just hope that that none of those things make it into the joint merge? Are there enough people still using System 5 in the outside world that we should care anyway? <laughs> none of our friends use it. <laughs> On the other hand, perhaps we should distribute the System 5 bugs to encourage everyone to use BSD. <laughs> who should we, we give an early copy to? Now, there are some people who we know we should give it to, and and that probably announce, amounts to a total of 60 copies. Is there anyone else that makes sense? What are the, who are the people in Europe who can be trusted to redistribute it in a sensible way and not post it to misc.general? How big a chunk of source code does it make sense to include either for fixes or for exploitation problems? We're going to say, this is a demonstration, compile this program and run it. Do we want to give people things that are sufficiently dangerous? Have we reduced the work effort? Are we going to get sued? How much lead time should we give to vendors in order to fix this? Is a year enough? Is 18 months enough? Will it never get fixed anyway? And we should just give it out to the world the following day. We've been considering including some scripted break-ins. This is where we'd ask four or five people who are very good at breaking into machines to sit down in a console with everything logged for a few hours, and we take the best of and just include terminal sessions. Since we're trying to make a complete list, we're looking for archives, security mailing lists, things we don't know about. If we're going to be in the encyclopedia, we don't want to end up being just half of the encyclopedia. And I suppose that's the end of what I have to say. Remember to check your return codes. Our second speaker is Lindsay Marshall from Newcastle University, who's going to talk about security and administration within Unix. My main aim is to talk about the principle of least privilege, which is easy to fix. Uh, it's re easy to adopt this but nobody does. When you get your distribution from the vendor, you will find it's completely wide open. People are distributing systems with the root directory with 777 permissions on it. 777 is much more dangerous than 666, but it's not as symbolic. Uh, though actually, that's not true. Alistair Crowley actually wrote a book called The Liber 777, which was a magical tome about 777. It has esoteric significance as well. Um, but vendors are dreadful. I don't know how many people actually look at this and think about this. You take your Unix system and you get it off the tape and you put it up and everything's owned by root. Everything is read-write permissions. It's just, it's totally frightening. And it can take you a couple of weeks, you know, just to fix this because you have to do this. I should also point out, we just put up the latest release of Sun OS. And I don't want to seem to be having a go at Sun here. I am having a go at Sun here. Um, 
the latest release of OS 4 came round, it's still got the SendMail debug in it. This is the latest release that was distributed the last two weeks, and it has still got the SendMail debug bug in it. So uh, that that's, doesn't show much hope for uh, vendors fixing their bugs. But the problem with distributions is not even just that they come around badly, is that they are sent around to people who don't know what they're doing. I'm sure most of the people in this room actually do know what you're doing. And the fact that you're here probably indicates this is true. But as workstations are being sold more and more into different, uh, different communities, and I particularly see this in universities, I don't think it's probably such uh, a major problem in industry because they tend to be purchased through uh, central purchasing and there are sort of some sort of people who know something about computing around uh, who can be look, look after these things and there may even be some sort of policy. But in universities the salesmen come around and suddenly everybody's realized there's these workstations we can sell them to the architects and to the medics and all these people who really don't know anything about computing and somebody in our architecture department just put in a new machine, a son. Um, and it was absolutely horrifying. There wasn't a root password on it. Uh, there was the one entry in the password file. Everything had read write permissions on it. And he actually plugged this on our network. And uh, he, he didn't, and it wasn't that the man in the architecture department was being malicious or stupid or anything. He just didn't know, and he had had no help from anybody. He didn't even know that there was an option that they would come and install the system for him. Nobody had told him anything. He had had no support. And I think this is absolutely true. I mean, not just Sun. Everybody does this. They just deliver machines and they dump it on these people who don't know anything about it. And from, from our point of view, I mean, it's, it's absolutely horrifying. We're all right because we can say, oh, well, let's just close all the doors and we pretend he doesn't exist. But uh, people say out in the, me the medical, de medical school don't actually know this. They've got sons out there. They're all, all on our campus Ethernet. And they can be wide open to somebody coming in from a machine in, uh, say, the architecture department, which has all these permission problems. There's a, a tremendous education problem. And you need to ram home to everybody that what you have to do is tighten the hatches right down completely and then only start loosening them up as you need to do it. Generally, you don't. The first thing, and this is the thing I, am, I always go on about, is that all your binary files, your executables, should just have execute permission. There is no need to have read permission on an executable. The worst d people for this is you look at any script that you get off the net. You get a piece of public domain software and well, and let's not look at the problems that could come in from pulling public domain software and you've no idea what's going on. One just trusts these things, whether that's sensible or not is, is a good question. But you pull things in and almost everybody's make files, if they have a make file at all, of course, which is uh, another problem, ha their install script will always copy up and they very carefully either give it read, write, execute, read, execute, read, execute, or read, execute, read, execute, read, execute. Nobody says, why do we need read permission to an executable, executable file? All right, you need read permission to a shell script. That's a different question. You don't need read permission to a binary image. This is even more the case when you have something that you've paid a license for. Some, some of these products like, say, Interleaf FrameMaker, these sort of things, where there are licensed things. If you've got that there sitting re with read permission on it, anybody can just copy the thing and take it off their own machine. All right, these programs have got little things built into them that are supposedly supposed to stop you running all these licenses and time bombs and all that sort of thing. But we all know that with a little bit of ingenuity, these things can all be got around should you wish to do that. So having, having read permission is a dangerous problem. And I think you could perhaps find yourself in some legal troubles with regard to illegal copies made of licensed products that you've had and all that sort of thing. I, that's a guess, I don't know. So when you install something in the binary directory, just give it execute permission. There is, of course, an old bug, and I asked Russell about this, it's gone in 4.3, but it was in there up to 4.2, was that you can actually read executable files even though you haven't got read permission to them. This is a bug that I certainly know was in v7. It may have been gone back beyond that. Uh, 
when you, you can use the ptrace debugging command in order to do this. If you try and ADB a program without read permission, it will say, oh, no, I can't do it. But if you write your own version of ADB that uses ptrace, you can actually read the core image of the program as it stands. And of course, you could then produce a dump, and then you've got, you've got a copy of the program anyway. So not giving read permission to the file is perhaps uh, not as important as it is. But if you're running a system with that bug fixed, it is. You, then people really can't read the file. The, most, uh, the thing that you should then do after that is have a large selection of user IDs and groups so that if, even if your permissions, your security is compromised on one ID, it's not compromised on another. All right, the problem we have in Unix is always the problem. If root is compromised, then, then, then you're totally screwed because you can get anywhere. But it may well be the case that only as another, some other IDs compromised. And then by limiting the use of that, you can make things fairly safe. This is a suggestion that actually came around in Gene Spafford's report on the Internet Worm, is that things like SendMail, Yellow Pages, I can't remember, he has a list of things. All these programs should run with their own user IDs, not as daemon. Everything runs as daemon. You give a, have a SendMail user ID and a SendMail group. You put it in that. Nothing else in there but SendMail. Same thing with yellow pages, all these things. You totally encapsulate all these different programs which are known to be dangerous. By doing this, you can then have put firewalls up, and you're starting to limit the problems that can come in. One of the main problems that with, with the uh, Internet one came around was because SendMail ran as the same user ID as other programs, and then you could make, take advantage of cascading holes. By putting this firewall up, some of those holes would have been closed. It's just tidier to have all your binary files owned by bin and your source files owned by source. It's just, just a cleaner way to do things. I could have put up lots of LSs and things like this. One, I haven't got many, any slides for this because they're very, very boring. I mean, it's just directories and what directories ought to look like. One of the problems that does come is, that is to decide which group to put things in. It isn't always easy to decide who should own what. And in fact, you may make mistakes to start with when you do it. I certainly know from my experience of uh, taking 4.2 and 4.3 and fixing the permissions on them, uh, that you often chose the wrong group to put things in. You would, you would say you put something in sys, a sys group, uh, and think, well, maybe that should be in bin. And you don't know. In fact, you need a lot. I mean, sys, I tend to have sort of bin and source and sys, and I, I'm rapidly coming to the conclusion that other than these things, that like a sendmail send mail user and those sort of things, that there should probably be a lib user who owns all the libraries and things like that. Because the advantage of this is that then, of course, you can then split out the administration. I'm looking at this from a system administration point of view, is that the administration will be split up. You can have somebody who is lib and looks after lib, just like at the moment most of us have somebody who looks after news and who's news. And then you have somebody who looks after UUCP. Who is UUCP? It may all be the same person. In fact, it almost inevitably is the same person. <laughs> but uh, what you should be doing is providing a long hat rack with all these little hats on it. And in fact, I, I actually have a, a belief that we should change SU. I can't actually see any use for being root most of the time. Even, I mean, I do this too, everybody does this. We've got all these nice little groups. We have bin and sys and all these things we put everybody in these things. And then, of course, you just SU to root and do all the work. <laughs> because it's a hassle. What we should actually do is have an SU that forces you to say, which hat are you putting on today? So, do you want to be news? Do you want to be this? One thing, one way of getting around this, of course, is with, a, with these separate IDs, it's actually safe to be bin. Unless you're going to say RM star, in which case it's never safe. Um, but you could fix that. You could then have, with lots of windows, it's always dangerous to have a window floating around that's root, because, of course, when you, you, you bump your cursor, it goes across into the screen. You type RM star thinking you're in the bottom window, and it's in the top window. Bang, there goes your system. Um, which is something that you may not have thought of, but it does happen. I haven't done it, but I've nearly done it. 
if you avoid root windows, you could then have, you could have a bin window up and a source window and a news window all on the screen at once, so you can just drop in and out of things should you be doing that kind of administration. Saves you typing all those nasty passwords all the time. That's actually another thing. When you do an SU you can, in your root, you can SU to any user you like. I'm not actually sure that that's particularly safe. Uh, perhaps you ought to know the passwords. There's something strange about, there's something very strange about Unix permissions actually. It, it needs, they stole the, the original DEC model of having three things, but DEC extended it with this system thing, and I have a feeling that you should be able to protect your files from the system as well. But we have to live with what we've got. So uh, I don't think we can change that. There is another problem, of course, with all this business about ownerships and things, is that the Chone program lives in different directories on different systems. Of course, it's privileged, but that's perfectly sensible because you wouldn't want to be able to change the ownership. It also doesn't have a convenient way of setting both the owner and the group easily. You can do it, I think you say Chone, well, it's probably number comma number. It's one of these horrible Unix programs that doesn't really work properly with names. This is another little hobby horse of mine that I should ride here, which is that everybody, anybody who says Chimod 666 or 777 or 555 ought to be taken out and strung up. It's not something you should be doing. You should say A plus RX. Who are you to know that the implementation of the kernel uses 777? It might not do that. It's a convention. It's much simpler to say, spell it out, say A plus RX. Because then you, you can look at this and you, think, you don't think, what does 666 mean? What does 555 mean? What on earth is the bit you set to put set group ID permission on, set user ID? You can never remember. You always go away and check. I can never remember what those numbers mean. You always go away and check. At least I hope you always go away and check. The, so, but I, you see, I don't have a problem because I can say U plus S, and I know that I've set user ID on. If I say plus T, I know I've put the tacky bit on, that sort of thing. It's important to use the slightly higher level interface. Let's get away from using this 777 thing. So when you see people with install 711 and all that sort of stuff, well, you all ought to send them hate mail and say, fix your make files. Uh, I think that's an important thing. And Chone has this similar problem, that uh, you want to be able to say, change this ownership of this file so that it's owned by this user and this group. If you have it right in the password file, which is another can of worms, let's not get into the password file, uh, what you want to do is to put the group to be this, the group that the owner is in, the user ID is in, in the password file, usually bin, bin, sys, sys. You've got all these groups. You tend to have, you ought to have a group for each user ID in the system area, not out in user space, no, it's a bit different. But you should probably have in there, so there's a bin, there's a bin, there's a news, there's a news. One for one. You can even give them the same numbers, which solves one or two problems, because if you can't, then you don't have to remember what the, the number is for the group. But Chone doesn't make it easy for you, because you can't just say Chone to bin, and it sets the group permission and the ownership one. Even though the system call does that, the program doesn't do it. Most of us have probably got a program called Chug, which changes user and group, uh, which you can see Chug bin file name, and it will set both the user and group. Mine is called Chug for historical reasons. It's a book by Quentin Crisp. I preferred the name, um, for which was change owner and group. But of course, O in Unix means others, so I always get very confused about that. So uh, that, that's, that's something I find a bit odd. I find O a difficult, difficult one in there. The parameters to Chimod saying all for owner or all for others. And I, it's a bit, sometimes I have to think about that. The, having set up your password file with all these bins and things like this and sys and source and then thrown away all the things that you don't think should be on the system anyway, that's a good thing to do because it cleans up your disk. Having decided things like whether people should have actually act, be able to do a PS and things like that, there's some interesting security questions actually about whether people should be able to do PS, whether they should be able to do who, for example. Uh, I'm not even sure it's legal to do who in this country. I have a strong suspicion that I remember years ago when the EMAS system was being developed at Edinburgh that they didn't have a who command in because there was some British telecom regulation which didn't let you transmit that sort of information down a wire. Uh, and I remember being told that. I don't know if it's true though. So, uh, that, so I'm not sure that who commands are actually legal. There are definite security problems about that. 
When you've set up all these things, the next thing is, of course, you've got to go through the whole file system, making sure all the files have the right permissions on them. And you need a tool to do this. There isn't actually a good one that does this. Writing the find script to do this is not easy. This is something that we will probably produce from my project, is it, because it's aimed at producing tools for, of this nature to help system managers. And we probably will produce a tool that will actually go around and search for anomalies, which is files owned by people other than who should be owned under this directory tree. So you can nominate certain parts of the de directory tree. For example, in the user group, the directory called Lindsay, everything below that ought to be owned by Lindsay. And if it isn't, well, if something's funny going on, it probably means I was logged in as root and did a CD to my own directory and created a file. I do that often enough. And then you can't delete them and things like that. So that you should look for these anomalies. You should also look for set UIDs. There's quite a good script that I hope you all are running every night which looks, goes around looking for set UID programs. It will find the set UID scripts and will tell you when they, they change. So that you have a list of ones that you know about. And when it changes, it will tell you straight away. You could also do things like check some in critical files. None of this takes, I mean, given all the CPU cycles we've got on these sites, none of us know what to do with on all these ridiculously fast machines. We, um, particularly at night when nobody's in, uh, you could actually go around and check some in critical resources and have a file which had these things in it. Make it difficult for the hacker. Have the information in so many different places that they don't know where they all are and they have to change so many different things that it's not worth their effort. Anybody can break security. I mean, this business of producing, uh, you know, you see, the, the, every year they get a new credit card and it becomes more and more complicated. What they're trying to do, it's not that you can't forge anything. You can forge anything. It's just that it's not economically viable to forge these things. So one of the things that we ought to be doing is making it hard. So having loads and loads of users is a good way of making it hard. Because then they've got, if they want to do particular things, if they can't crack root, and we should be able to fix that, then they've got to crack all these individual users. And it's just not worth the effort. Our next speaker is Andy Rutter from the instruction set. He's going to talk about SUN's secure remote procedure call. OK, what I'm going to talk about today is the secure RPC system that's part of the Sun ONC, Open Network Compute Computing, um, a.k.a. NFS. <coughs> um, and as, as the talk progresses, we'll see exactly what this does, does for us. Um, <coughs> so, OK, where are we coming from? I think by now all of us in, in the room know that network services are certainly less secure than standalone. Um, now, one of, one of the reasons that existing network uh, programs, network services are secure is that um, networked applications, uh, the security of networked applications is, is, is hard. It's much easier to ignore security than to put it in. After all, users are basically trustworthy, aren't they? Um, so when when the R login program was written, or Telnet was written, it was much easier to ignore it. In a lot of cases, security was added as an afterthought. It's tacked on as the si at the side, uh, rather like a wart uh, on the side of the program. Um, <clears throat> and even after security has been, has been added in, in a Unix environment, it's, it's very easy to fake it. I'm sure all of us who have used a, a network of Unix machines have faked um, <clears throat> our um, credentials in order to gain access to, to someone else's files. It's, it's very easy to do in that environment. <clears throat> okay. one, of, one of the solutions to security is, is to leave it up to the application. Okay. Now again, it's, the problem with that is it's much easier to ignore it. If you leave it up to the application developer to put the security in, okay, the application developer wants an easy time, so they leave it out. Um, <clears throat> if the application developer does successfully put it in, it's usually implemented in a very ad hoc manner. Um, much wheel reinvention takes place as the security features uh, are implemented in the application. So it goes without saying, it's much better to put it in as a, as a service consistency uh, in the security is, is much easier to achieve if the, the application developer can't ignore it, uh, it comes with the, um, the application environment. Okay, and the one I'm going to talk about today is at the RPC level. Okay. 
The authentication is done on a RPC request response basis. Uh, what secure RPC doesn't do for you is encrypt the data. So if you're really worried about people spying on your data, um, secure RPC won't, won't help you. The assumptions that Sun made in developing the, the methodology is that on the networks they use, it's not possible to replace packets. So here we're talking about broadcast-style networks rather than um, a, a, a ring-style network where you can steal packets and replace them. Eavesdroppers are not really a worry. Okay, so you're not, you're not worried about people looking at your data. You're just worried about um, users impersonating you, okay, adding packets to the network to, to fake requests or indeed fake responses. Right. Um, I, don't, I don't think I need to explain what RPC is. Um, I, I really wanted to look at how um, the request response is, is authenticated. Um, with, with Sun RPC, the, the client sends, you know, ignore the request part and, and the, the arguments, the client sends some credentials and a verifier to the server, and the server responds with a verifier. Okay, this, is, this is necessary so that the server can be sure it's talking to the, the correct client and vice versa. Okay. Um, <clears throat> with the RPC shipped from Sun prior to secure RPC, then there was no, there was no verifier. The, the Unix-style authentication had, had a null verifier, so that when the, the server responded, there was no way for the client to be sure that this was the correct server, so it's possible to impersonate. Okay. So this is the problem that Secure RPC is addressing, the problem of verification of both ends uh, of the conversation. <coughs> now, how's it done? Well, there's unfortunately a, a, a fault in this slide, um, so don't pay too much attention to it. Um, the, the way the re request and response is authenticated is through timestamps. Uh, the timestamps are encrypted so that the, the server will decrypt the timestamp, examine it, and if it's within the correct range, um, then the, the request is, is valid. The encryption is done using public and private keys. And I'll talk more about that uh, on the next slide. Um, public and private keys are um, fairly secure, but not, not completely secure. Um, I know of several people who can crack DES um, w within a, a reasonable space of time. So to, to avoid using the, the public key mechanism for every request response um, transaction, a conversation key is generated, not as it says there from the public and private keys, but at random. The, the key used to encrypt every um, transaction is generated at random, and that's passed once using the public um, and private keys. Okay. So, how does this work? In the, the very first transaction, the very first request from the client to the server, as credential, the client sends um, some, some ID identifying the client, usually it's name, um, a, a domain name for the, for the client. It sends the conversation key, they're called CK, encrypted using the, the public key mechanism. And it also sends um, a window value okay, for the timestamps. Okay, the, the server will look at timestamps that the client sends and use the window to determine whether or not the timestamp is valid. Okay. So it sends three pieces of information. Client identifier, conversation key, encrypted using the public key, and the window value encrypted using the, the conversation key in the credential field. As verifier, we send the current time and we send uh, the window value plus one. Okay. Uh, using times 
uh, relies on the client and server being synchronized. If the client doesn't have a, a real-time clock or, or a reliable clock, then it can get the time value from the server. Okay. Um, the client and server will get out of step. The, the time values will drift. Uh, th this just means that eventually the client-generated time value will get outside the window. And at that point, the server will reject the request and they just resynchronize again. Okay. The reason for sending the window value here and then window value plus one is to um, avoid faking the, uh, the verifier by someone just generating those fields at random. Okay. It's possible to reproduce a valid credential by filling in those three fields with random numbers and eventually you'll get one that decrypts properly if you do it often enough. But by sending win plus one, the chances of getting a valid decryption by random uh, field generation is, is reduced. In the response, the server sends um, the time value minus one, encrypted using the conversation key, and it sends an ID. Okay. Because we're using this randomly generated key for re the RPC transactions, the server needs to hold the conversation key. The client generated the conversation key, sends it to the server, the server needs to hold it. So it caches it in a table and it sends back the ID, like a file handle for the conversation key. <coughs> the time minus one okay, is sent back so that should there be an eavesdropper who is successfully decrypting um, the, these values, by the time they've decrypted it, this time value is going to be so way out of the window, it's going to be useless. So this can't be replayed. Okay. And on subsequent transactions, the, the client just sends the ID, okay. and the server indexes its conversation key table to um, decrypt the timestamps. Okay. So the, the request is allowed if the decrypted time falls within the band current time plus window. If it's outside that time, then the request is rejected. Okay. So the server can be sure that the, the correct client is sending the request, and by use of the verifier, the client knows it's talking to the correct server. Okay. So the basic mechanism is encryption of timestamps inside a window. Now. <coughs> Very quickly, I'll go through the mechanism for uh, generating the, the public and <coughs> the, the encryption value from the public and private keys. Um, this is only used once uh, because it is less secure than a randomly generated key. The client here, A, has a public key which is stored in a publicly readable database. Uh, and it has a secret key, which only the client knows. Okay. And the relationship between the public and the secret keys is that the public key is some well-known constant raised to the power of the secret key. And the same happens for the, the server. So the server has a secret key and has a public key in a database. Um, on on a, a you know, Motorola 6820, it takes about between one and two seconds to do that calculation. Okay, so I mean, it's not feasible for someone to try, try to um, generate <coughs> uh, the values on, on the fly. Then you generate a, a key which is unique to client and server. So K, key AB is public key raised to the power secret key. Okay. Public key of one, secret key the other one. Okay. And if you do the substitution, yeah. you get back constant raised to the power both secret keys. So the client can generate a, an encryption key, 
and the server can generate the same encryption key using only the publicly available information. Okay. So that the key generated by the server is the same as the key generated by the client. So that so the server can successfully decrypt the random conversation key uh, that the client has sent. <coughs> now. Okay. In terms of um, the, the implementation, um, there, are, there are some considerations we have to look at. First of all, there's the, uh, the naming conventions. Um, <coughs> the, the server, uh, so the client, must be, must be able to identify itself to the server so that the, the server can retrieve the public key for the client. So we need a, a global naming scheme. Okay? And the one implemented in the, the Sun code um, uses a domain um, naming scheme rather, rather like it. Well, in the US, they, they use the ARPA domain scheme. I, that, that would be my name uh, within the inset domain. Um, machine names. Machines also need names um, so that root is allowed access to, uh, to remote servers. Okay, so unix.toolset will be equivalent to uh, the user root on my machine. Okay, so both machines need name for, for root access and also if you have a diskless machine, uh, the machine needs, needs a, a name. The, the source that's available now, um, called NFS Source 4.0, um, contains a secure implementation of YP and a secure implementation of NFS using the RPC mechanism. The, the keys um, are held in a local key server RPC service. So each machine has a local daemon that holds all of the keys for users on that machine and it accepts RPC requests for storage uh, and retrieval of, of keys. And those are the three the, uh, procedures. Um, only the user root can send uh, requests to the key server to avoid normal users coming along and trying to replay or um, cr crack the keys. What is important for the code we get in here outside US is there's no DES in there, but there are so many different implementations of DES, it doesn't really matter. The, the YP has a new database to contain the, the keys. Um, YP also implements a, a generalized update service. Okay, so um, the password is no longer a special case. Users can update um, their own private fields of a, of a public database. Okay. Not very interesting, really. What is interesting is secure NFS. Um, the NFS code is not changed at all. Um, secure RPC goes into s the, the code as a new authentication mechanism. So all previous um, RPC applications can use the new authentication method, mechanism. You simply relink with the new library. There are no new calls um, at the user level. You shouldn't even be aware that um, secure RPC is being used. In order to access the secure NFS files, then there are some extra fields in the administrative databases. In the exports file, uh, we can mark a file system as exported secure. And then when we mount it, we have to um, indicate that it is secure. So we put in the FS tab file. If you mount a file system that has been exported secure, but you don't use secure in the mount command or in FS tab, then it's mounted read only. That's the way it's implemented. <clears throat> How do we break it? Well, it's not too difficult to break um, the, the Sun Secure RPC. Um, <clears throat> one thing you can do is, is wait for a server to crash. 
um, having stored up all of the transactions, you've monitored the network, okay. if you put a tap onto the network and, and store all of the RPC transactions that you see go past, when the server crashes, you can replay them because the RPC headers contain valid um, keys and valid timestamps. Okay. So while, when the server comes back up, you can just replay all of those uh, to the server. Um, the way you avoid that is by making the window as small as possible. So if you make the window less than the time it takes the server to reboot, uh, you remove um, that security hole. Okay. Normally the window is 30 minutes. Some, some more problems, um, obviously with the server crash, you, you get a, a security window, a security hole window uh, when the server crashes. Um, the cached keys disappear, so the client needs to resend the, the, the conversation key. Uh, if you've got diskless machines, it's obviously e easy to impersonate a, a boot server um, and, and store the keys that way. Uh, another, another problem is that uh, unless user Dave has logged in, then set UID programs owned by Dave will not run because there's no conversation key stored for Dave until he logs in and gives his password. Okay, so if you have a set UID program you've allowed other users access to, it won't work unless you're logged in. <coughs> okay. Now the, the aim of Secure RPC was to make a client server set up as, as secure as a normal standalone system. Okay. The, the aim wasn't to make it super secure, uh, but just to claim back some of the security that was given to you by, by a single Unix machine. Um, and that's been achieved with low overhead per transaction. There are holes with it. Okay. Uh, it's possible to eavesdrop, it's possible to look at the data, but then, as I said before, uh, on my home directory, anyone can read the files, and I don't mind. Okay. So if that is your environment, Secure RPC will be suitable. <coughs> it provides the minimum necessary to ensure authentication of request and response. It does not encrypt the data. It does not prevent other people from eavesdropping on the net and, and reading your files as they go past. And it does that with a low overhead, typically two to five milliseconds per transaction for that um, client-server authentication. And I would say it's adequate security for general use. And that was the aim of the Sun developers, not to make it super secure, to make it adequate for, for normal use. 